Tonight's top EU stories from the unit website include EU farming groups express concerns about GM regulations. Faroe Islands launch WTO dispute over EU fishing restrictions. 50,000 people march in Ukraine, urging government to sign EU deal. And EU to Ukraine will sell you Russian gas cheaper than the Russians will. Plus, Europe for Citizens programme. I'm Rick Timmis and this is the unit Nightly News. First up, the restrictions on growing GM crops in the European Union are greater than anywhere else in the world. Efforts to change them provoke controversy and, because the steps necessary to effect change depend in part on politicians taking a view about public opinion, the restrictions remain in place. In an effort to free the logjam, EU farming groups including the NFU, NFU Cymru, NFU Scotland and Ulster's Farmers Union have added their names to open letters written by the French Association for Plant Biotechnology to the Commission expressing deep concern about the effect of GM policies and the regulations in the EU. It calls for better access to the best crops including GM varieties so that agriculture in Europe can be more sustainable and less reliant on imported products and says that the lack of options can lead to loss of income and missed opportunities for EU farmers. Well, it beggars belief that the national farming community really support these GM crops programmes. I cannot understand why farmers would want to ensnare themselves into what strikes me as a corporate trap. But this highlights a wider issue, the silent majority. Notice how the lobbyists and corporations only need to get into bed with a few industry bodies to create the perception of a movement in one direction or the other. What is needed is action by the majority to voice their opinions. The Faroe Islands launched a trade dispute at the World Trade Organization on Monday to challenge a European Union ban on imports of Faroese herring and mackerel and restrictions on Faroese vessels entering EU ports. The measures implemented by the EU are in clear contravention of basic provisions of the WTO agreement, the Office of Faroese Prime Minister Kaj Leo Holm Johansson said in a statement. Now, contrary to claims by the EU that the measures are a means to conserve the Atlanto Scandian herring, the coercive measures implemented by the EU against the Faroe Islands appear designed to protect EU industry interests. <laughs> well, well, there's a surprise. Now, I agree with Mr. Johansson. Search for fish and fishing in our archives and you'll see the pattern emerge. The EU is struggling to support fishing because of stock depletion in its main waters. It is using EDF funds, European Development Funds, to attempt to buy up access to fishing rights off West Africa and a number of Pacific islands. About 50,000 demonstrators rallied in the centre of Kiev on Sunday to demand the Ukraine's government reverse course and sign a landmark agreement with the European Union in defiance of Russia. The protest was the biggest Ukraine has seen since the peaceful 2004 Orange Revolution, which overturned a fraudulent presidential election result and brought a Western-leaning government to power. The rally was led by Ukraine's top opposition figures, who called for the protests to continue until President Viktor Yukovych agreed to sign the free trade and political association deal with the EU at a summit on Friday. But this shows the economic pressures that the people in the Ukraine are feeling. But it also shows the deceit that is taking place with regards to what joining the EU really means. Take a look at Croatia as an example. The EU would destroy Ukraine's industry with its bureaucracy, the acquis communitaire. The EU's massive book of rules would impose enormous costs on industrial modernisation. And if the Ukraine went ahead, it would need to borrow money from the IMF to fund such a development programme. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is the whole point. That is how the mechanism of assimilation works. Countries are coerced into joining with the promise of development funds and improved wealth. But to support the process requires becoming indebted to the Troika. This creates the technocratic control that the EU is really looking for. It is the common trap of the economic hitman.
When last we left it, Ukraine was snubbing Russian gas in the run-up to its landmark vote later this month on joining a free trade and association agreement with the European Union. Since then, Ukraine has restarted imports, though is still paying some of the highest prices in Europe for the privilege. Kiev has long played Moscow against Brussels, but has an opportunity on November 28th to more decisively move more decisively away from its former Soviet master. Losing the Ukraine would permanently scar Putin's legacy. He hopes to create a Eurasian trade union to recover Russia's sphere of influence, and the Ukraine would be the pearl in that union. But the vote isn't a foregone conclusion, as the Ukrainian parliament has so far failed to release the jailed opposition leader Yulia Tymoshenko, one of the requirements Brussels has set forth for Kiev. And there it is again, folks, just as we have been talking about, the Eurasian Union. This Eurasian Union has been on the cards for a long time, and in fact, in development for some time too. The mainstream media have deliberately ducked using the term, and this story comes from the US because it's unlikely that you'll see this word used in the European media. Now, as always, the unstated agenda is fossil fuel resources, and there is a simple reason for that. Everything. Yes, everything in our Western capitalist societies is built upon fossil fuels. So, whoever controls these resources, well, they run the show. And that's why I'm so keen on the UK taking a lead on fusion energy, something I feel we are very well positioned to achieve. So, the European Union wants us to believe that it's all about trading, that its goal is one of creating a single economic market, and that it wants to leave nation-states with political autonomy. Well, it all sounds reasonable enough. Why then is the European Commission pushing legislation through the Parliament to develop a European citizen programme? Citizen means member of a national society. That means a nation-state called Europe would have to exist for it to contain European citizens. Well, that might be a good argument for the abolition of the nation-state, and in this new age of globalisation, then the next logical step would be to become a global citizen of Earth. These ideas are fine, but they must be brought about transparently, openly, and within a system that is of the people and for the people. Now, check out this article in our legislation section and see for yourself what they're up to now. Today, in our video library, let's talk about economic hitmen. This short video shows an economic hitman, John Perkins, and he explains how these folks work. In short, the model is to set up a loan to a country to improve infrastructure. The infrastructure is supplied by corporations from the countries that are pulling the scam. This sets up a power structure at the highest level that can be used to control nation states and even oust governments and political leaders. See Italy and Greece for examples. I'm Rick Timmis, reporting for the unit, Nightly News. I'll see you soon. <laughs>